so we don't have anybody sitting behind the piano going like that. So then we just think, okay, well, we've got one family in our church that does special music, and, but uh, we'd love to have special music like this. So any of you want to come and, to the Nova Scotia, sing for us, you know, play piano for us. We've got some open spots. We'd love to have you come. And uh, we, do, we really enjoy that. In the book of 3rd John, I want to just, again, thank you for supporting us. We're going to get a little bit to that in the message. But in the book of 3rd John, which we read this morning, we, this is one of those general epistles, but it's written to a particular individual. And what God's doing in the general epistles is it's for everybody. It's one of those that he writes, you know, we have some church epistles that are written to the churches. And uh, if you're a member of the church, you go, okay, this is God writing to me about this. And, and uh, there's church content and there's individual things that are, that are written in those, those letters as well. But when you get to the general epistles, those are written to the general public. They're written to the Christians who should be in church, etc. And in this particular case, it's written to an individual. So God is saying that you can put your name in that place. Under the well beloved Gaius. Okay? Gaius was a prominent name in, uh, in the Roman Empire, which gave you a very prominent name during this time. And uh, you can put your name to the well beloved John Doe. Okay? Put your name. God's writing to you. God wants to tell you some things. God wants to direct your life about some things. And I want you to draw your attention to exactly what it is that God has to say to you. There are two prominent things. I'm not going to deal with the first, just mention it. I want to deal more with the second parts of this. Two prominent things that God says to you as an individual. So I want you to think about yourself as we, again, look at this passage of Scripture. The first is that he, he encouraged them. He says, the one thing that I like about you is that you've learned how to walk in the truth. Verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, says the elder unto the well-beloved gave us, whom I love in the truth. That word truth is the prominent word of the truth. The truth is what matters. The truth is what matters. Not all the lies, not all of the, the, the uh, religiosity things, but the truth. The truth. He goes on and says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. I thought about my own life. What if God were to say that to you? I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health connected to your soul's prosperity. Some people wouldn't be too healthy. Some people wouldn't be too prosperous. Some people would have to struggle with those things because their soul is not prospering. One of those things, if God were to connect your prosperity and your health with your soul's prosperity, well, how healthy would you be? How much prosperous would you be? But that's not what I'm preaching on. Let's get on here. The Bible says in verse number three, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, You've learning the truth. You're being taught the truth. That's why you come to church. That's why you sit in Sunday school. I enjoy being in Sunday school. Letting somebody else teach me this morning. I don't normally get that. I'm normally doing all the teaching, all the preaching, all, you know. And I really enjoyed it. I appreciated that. I appreciate that there's other people, you know, that, that love the truth and will teach it. And God says here, he's talking about, he says, I, I, I rejoice. They, they, he says, for the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. So they're putting it in practice. They just weren't learning it. They were walking in the truth as well. And God ties it all together in verse number four. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Every pastor's desire, every missionary that I've ever met, Every Sunday school teacher, of true Sunday school teachers we're talking about, that's our desire. No greater joy than to hear that our children walk in the truth, spiritual children, that they walk in the truth, that that's what matters. But that's the first part. That's the first thing that God said to, to, to Gaius. He says, I want you to know about the truth. I see that in you, he says, but there's a second. He's lifting them up and saying, that is great. And some people, they think about that, but then they don't think about the second part. And the second part, God says, not only were you walking in the truth, but verses 5 through 8, which we'll get to in just a moment. Verse number 8 says, well, let's look at verse number 8. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. It's not enough for you to know the truth. It's not enough for you to walk in the truth. It's not enough for you to have the truth within you. God wants you also to be a fellow helper to the truth. Not only being a testimony to other people, but 
but it is the aspects that we'll talk about this morning. A fellow helper to the truth. When you read this passage of scripture, there's a lot in it. I don't have time to get it into all, but let me give you just a couple of points. Things that, that God has touched my heart about. That we become fellow helpers to the truth. There are three things that God, that we as missionaries, that we, that I remember when I went out to the mission field, when I went as a missionary and as a pastor, etc. I try to teach our people, now that we have a, a, a little congregation, uh, how to deal with the proper aspects of missions. How to deal with the, with the reality that we're not the only ones in this corner of the world. Seems like it sometimes. Out there in the Nova Scotia, you know, we feel like we're the end of the world. That you, There's not a whole lot around about us. There's not others that we can rely on, we can fellowship with. We're it, you know, sort of thing. And so we try to teach them that there's more to this. There's more to the Christian life than just your life. There's more to it than just you walking in the truth. Now, yeah, we struggle with walking in the truth. And we struggle to make sure that we get the, the truth and et cetera. But once we get it, we need to be fellow helpers to the truth. And so God says there are three things I want you to do. He says, and not only that you should do, but he says, these are things that I commend you for doing. And so as I stand here this morning... I'm speaking in that sense of commending this church. Now, I don't know you individually, so I couldn't write a letter to you as an individual. I know this church. I know what this church has meant to us on the field. I know what this church has done for us. And so I speak to the church in that sense. But I hopefully that as you are the members of this church, I'm speaking to you as an individual. I could write and I could say, unto the well-beloved church, although this is a general epistle, Messiah, Baptist Church, and this would be true. But I want you to think about, is it true in my life, too? As a member, or is it coming to this church, whether you're a member or not, is this true about me as an individual? He says in verse number 5, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. But the first point is in verse number 8. Verse number he says, we therefore ought to receive such. If you want to be a fellow helpless to the truth, there are people who are willing to, to carry the truth, missionaries or whatever the case may be, but they need help. I couldn't be on the field without your help. It's impossible. I'll tell you a little bit about that as we get into this, but the things that, that we as missionaries we go through, we go away from what is home. We go away from all the things that we know and go to a place where, where we are strangers and we need to be reminded that we're that people that are fellow helping us have first of all done some their part. The first thing that God says is that you receive them. Verse 5. To the brethren and to strangers. When I first came to Messiah Baptist Church I was a stranger to you and yet you received me. I wasn't a stranger to Pastor Dave, even me, but you folks were, I was a stranger to you. I came back, I come back here after being on the mission field. I've been on the mission field 31 years. I'm even stranger now than I was when I left. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a stranger to you. I might be a strange brethren, but I'm a, I'm a brethren now. And God says, I, I commend you for what you do for two people, the strangers and the brethren. When we first go to the mission field, we're all strangers. I mean, when I was out on deputation raising support, and when I was, I went into churches, I was a stranger to people took me in, and, 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 and they based it upon what we had believed and our doctrinal beliefs, but I was a stranger. I hadn't gone to the field. I, you didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, I told you I was going to go, you know, plant a church and try to win people to Christ, the same thing that you folks are doing, baptize them and teach them all the things that, that the Bible teaches. But I was a stranger to you, and yet you received us. You took us in and said, okay, we will be, we, we will accept that. You, you received us, just as Michael says in verse number 5. He says, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Now I come back several years after being a part of Messiah's uh, missions group. And I'm no longer a stranger, at least I hope not. You folks have prayed for me. You folks have, have known about me. I've written letters and back, and even though you've not, some of you have not met me personally, I'm still not a stranger here. I'm one of the brethren, and you know it, and your church has been faithful in that aspect, and you've again received me, and you've brought me in, and you, you've uh, been very gracious to us. 
You've not compared me with other people. I'm very grateful for that. Sometimes I compare myself with other people. I know that I'm not supposed to do that. Sometimes I, as a missionary, in my missionary capacity, I get in this. I know I'm not supposed to do that too. Breaks my heart when I did it that way. I said, okay, God, just please forgive me and I'll not be envious. I was envious. I remember the first time I came back to be on the field several years. Came back for a missions conference. And uh, missionaries, the other missionaries got up. We got kind of comparing notes. I know we're not supposed to do that, but that's just what missionaries do. Hey, you know, how long have you been on the field? So and so been on the field so long. And what, what are you kind of doing, you know? And, and uh, how many churches do you got? And how many people do you got, you know? And, and what's, 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 what's going on in your work, you know? And, and how fast is it growing? And, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. And I'd sit back there and I'd go. They'd ask me, and I'd go, I don't know. Because the works don't grow in Nova Scotia. It's been there for 31 years, and we're still struggling, you know. It's not something that happens very quickly. It's something that takes time to work in Nova Scotia. These people are slow about accepting the truths of the Word of God. It's not like, you know, you in some of the fields, I, you know, they'd show their pictures and they'd show how, the, you know, they, they'd come and do a new area and they'd put up a tent and they'd go invite people and, and they'd, people would come out of the mountains, you know, and just flood into the area and they'd fill up their their, 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 their groups, you know, and, and boy, they get to preach to hundreds of people and people, a hundred people get saved and then they had baptism and, you know, 50 people or 60 people get baptized and I'd go, yes, amen, praise God for their ministry. And then I'd come Hard. There's a lady. We had a man that got saved when I first went to, to the field. Young man, young, young teenager. He's now still with us. I uh, got married and uh, he's got a family. We prayed for his mother for years and years and years. I've been on the field for 31 years. 20 years later, she got saved. I had a privilege baptized. Now we rejoice in that, but that's just the way it is. We got men that come to our church and, man, we work with them and 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 we pray for them and we pray for them. Maybe 15, 10, 10, 15 years later, they might get saved. That's the way it is in Nova Scotia. I get jealous and I go, oh, God. And yet you didn't compare us. You've been faithful, you know, and I think to myself, why would anybody support them, you know? Because <laughs> what, 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 what the work they're not doing. Well, we are doing it. We're sowing a seed. I'm waiting for somebody to come along and reap that seed. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I can say at least, you know, that there's seed been sown. I know there's products of the ministry. My wife is one of those products. When I first went to the field, I was married to a different woman. She died, by the way. Just make it cut, cut through all of that. And not that, you know. And uh, anyway, she died childbirth. And I had six children at the time, 1995. It happened. I went through a terrible time in 1995. My wife passed away. I had a new baby. How am I going to take care of six small children? Man, what? I wanted to leave the field then. After a few months of working in that ministry and there, you know, in 1995, I had some problems and shortly after that. And, and uh, but God had, we had in the past had won my wife, Marnie, to the Lord, my wife and I. And she was teaching Sunday school, working the Sunday school class with my wife when my wife died. And she was like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I hadn't gone to the field, where would I be now? I'd be six, you know, would I be unmarried? I don't know. You know, but uh, I'm telling you, it takes time. It works. It's, it's hard work. And yet you folks received us under those conditions. Had some problems with our sending church shortly thereafter. I wanted to 